There's anime that everybody has seen, and then there are anime like this. Welcome to Anime Obscura. Mind Game is the equivalent of dropping three tabs while scuba diving in a kiddie pool, okay? There may not be much substance, but you're gonna have a damn good time. The movie follows self-proclaimed loser Nishi, a beginner mangaka, as he fails to take any chances throughout life and essentially lets all his goals and aspirations slip through his fingers, only to end up with the wrong end of a gun gently nestled between his booty cheeks before the bullet retraces his digestive tract and explodes out of his cranium. And that's just how Mind Game starts with backdoor gunplay. Believe me when I say that this movie is definitely not for everybody. It's one of the weirdest, craziest anime films ever produced and by the time credits roll, you're gonna feel both exhausted and refreshed at the same time. A similar feeling to coming down from a long trip. Director Masaki Yasa finally figured out how to give Japan a legal psychedelic experience through a substance commonly called animation. You're gonna be confused, you're gonna be weirded out, you're gonna see some face animations that look like they're out of a shoddy horror fan film, but you'll also see some of the most beautifully crafted animated segments the early 2000s has to offer. Mind Game is the type of movie where the plot is just, it's just background noise. I'm gonna spoil the entire movie, and uh, that's not gonna have any effect on your enjoyment if you're a first time viewer. Mind Game has the same intense non-stop visual roller coaster ride and nonsensical storyline that we've seen in films like Dead Leaves and Red Line, but it takes it to a whole new level. I could legitimately go over every single plot point piece by piece and it wouldn't make any difference because it just doesn't make much sense. It's utter insanity. No one thinks Mind game is mid, okay? You either love it or you hate it, but either way, you'll come out the other side with an experience that is completely unmatched by any other anime film, and yet, somehow despite the plot being an utterly irrelevant, difficult, splattered mess, there is no doubt that this film holds a profound and important purpose within its story. It's a message that we all know, but we've never seen quite like this. So if you're ready to do jujutsu with the sphincter, become whale food, and run on atomic particles, then this movie's for you. This is Mind Game. Let's get into it. Hey everybody, Mike here. Want to support the channel and our new series where we cover obscure anime like Mind Game that will absolutely get wrecked by the YouTube algorithm? Then consider throwing a couple bucks towards our Patreon. The only reason Bonsai Pop continues to exist is because of Patreon, and it allows us to make unique videos on topics that literally never get talked about. If you want to see more anime obscura on the channel, consider joining the community. Link is in the description. Let's get back to it. You ever had the love of your life tell you she's gonna marry someone else, fantasize about winning her back and then chicken out in the same two minutes, all with close-ups of animation combined with live action to create... I don't know, this. Mind game begins with Nishi happening upon his childhood love, Mion, after her foot gets trapped in a subway door and a YouTube thumbnail style arrow points out you can see her underwear. It's pretty clear from scene one that this movie is just so quirky, but really it's wild and it's not gonna go where you're expecting it to go. Anyway, after a short conversation where Mion tells Nishi of her intention to marry, the two walk to Mion's family yakitori restaurant currently being run by Mion's sister, Yan, while the sister's father gets drunk in the corner. And then in walks a jacked up Captain Underpants using his soccer ball as a stress toy along with a Yakuza. Both, by the way, are looking for Mion's father. The old man stole Pinhead's girlfriend, which, as it turns out, is a bad idea when the Yakuza are involved, okay? Thumbface's rage boils over and he smacks the shit out of Mion's fiance, gives her the bad touch, because this is still Japanese production, they have a lot of social work to do, only to turn his underwear gun on Nishi's brown eye as Nishi hyperventilates in the fetal position. And in maybe the first moment in his life, Nishi's anger overshadows his fear, and he screams, I'm going to hurt you, which honestly is probably one of the meaner things you can say in Japanese. The gun penetrates him from butt to brain as his soul leaves his body. Nishi wakes up as a force ghost in a realm of pure blackness, swiftly being captured and caged by God's VCR system so he can watch himself get that lethal endoscopy over and over. The dude is ugly crying out of every hole in his face to the point where his anger and desperation finally push him to claw at the black nothingness, revealing it's merely a curtain to a white void whose only inhabitant is an ever-changing being who can take on any appearance. You wanna be you wanna be a hippie, sexy fish head woman, poop hippo, you name it. Now this being is kind of a dickhead. 
and uh, knows what Nishi is thinking, screws with his emotions. So yeah, it's, you know, it's God, aka Kami-sama. Kami tells Nishi that there is no afterlife. Also, God's got a date and can't wait around with Nishi, so just go to the red portal and disappear into nothingness, alright? Obviously realizing that the red portal means true death, no afterlife, no nothing. Well, that just means that the portal on the other end of the void leads back to life. Overcome with determination, pushing himself further and further away from fading and back into life. The knowledge that nothing comes after death has renewed Nishi's conviction to live life to the fullest, filling him with a new sense of willpower. He now knows that there's only one chance at life, and he's driven to find his way back to Earth and make the most of it. This energy pushes him to reach the end of the void, literally falling off a cliff back into the world he just died in. And while I said the plot doesn't matter and it's really only the transportation to get us from one crazy scene to the next, there is no doubt in my mind that this is a primary theme in the movie. We only have one shot, so you gotta make the most of it. Like that Eminem song. The truth is, we have no clue what's coming after death, right? Maybe reincarnation is a thing, maybe there's heaven and hell, maybe death is just another path, one we almost quote Gandalf to take. The point is, there's no assurance we get anything else, but what we do know is that we're here now, we have this chance, and the best thing we can do with our time is to make the most of it by experiencing, enjoying anything and everything life has to offer. And if you can't tell by my tone, it's very cliche. But honestly, this is kind of a huge motto that I try to follow in my own life. My primary goal right is not making money or power or you know being famous it's happiness and wisdom and spreading that i'm here doing what i do to enjoy life as much as i can because i've tried other things and it wasn't great but obviously this isn't some extraordinary unique lesson mind game is trying to instill in its viewers hell there's thousands of movies shows books and plays that contain the exact same message arguably in a better or at least a more palatable way what separates mind game is the visualizations of its themes. It's both blatantly obvious that's what Mind Game is about, yet incredibly obscured because the animation is so compelling, but also very distracting, possibly ugly. No one is analyzing the plot when there's a reverse mermaid smoking a cigarette as God, okay? The asinine nature of Mind Game makes the obvious opaque. Again, this movie is a trip, and we just hit one of the peaks but this vision has only just begun. Now, through inexplicable time travel, Nishi returns to his body moments before bullet to butt penetration. With the power of a thousand kegels, he disarms the soccer bro with his bunghole like a gluteus arts master, killing the dude with his own weapon. He holds the Yakuza at gunpoint while getting the sisters out of the restaurant, stealing the Yakuza's car, and making their getaway. It's here you can really see the difference in Nishi for the first time. He's no longer scared of anything. I mean, I guess once you take a bullet up the bung, you know, it's, it's gonna change you guys. But letting the Jesus take the wheel, talking back to a Yakuza's boss who's got his goons chasing him down, pulling off the impossible, physics-defying stunts only seen in the movies. He's living on the edge, bro. He's enjoying the thrill, taking more risks in a matter of moments than he had in his entire 20 years of prior living. Nishi is literally a reborn man. This so long it becomes funny again car chase sequence climaxes figuratively and literally at the top of a lifting bridge roadblocked by Yakuza goons. Nishi swerves at the last minute, flying the car himself and the sisters straight into the mouth of a gigantic whale that surfaced for breakfast just off the shore like Pinocchio or something. And with that, we naturally come to the second and most important section of the film, the whale stomach. Dazed and confused, the sisters are scared out of their minds, trapped in the dark inside of a car taking on water. Nishi, looking like an absolute madman with eyes like flying saucers, actually gives them some really good advice, right? Fear takes the shape we're willing to give it. He gives a somewhat moronic but impassioned speech about how to change your perspective on a situation. Think this is fun, even if it's a lie. Remember how it was to be a child and explore without worry of tomorrow. Believe it's an adventure and it will be. Turn your fear into excitement. That's what it means to make the most out of every moment. The same fears he had at the very beginning of the movie. The fears of confessing his feelings for Mion, shaped from his own mental state, immobilized him. These same fears stopped him from growing and maintaining an intimate relationship with her in their youth. He kept her at arm's length at school, only comfortable messaging over email or passing her notes. His fear is what he made it, and it crippled him early in life. And then the next time you see him, he's driving a car. He just lets go of the wheel entirely, and everybody's like, yo, why are you letting go of the wheel? And then he crashes. Actually, that was Fight Club. Anyway, Nishi now sees this far 
far more terrible circumstances, a new adventure. Not an impossible situation, but an exciting piece of opportunity. Excitement in the face of adversity pushes you forward instead of cementing you in place. With this newfound resolution, he picks up both girls emotionally like the cult leader he's destined to become, and they follow him into the water towards a far off stranded ship. Upon climbing on top of the ship, they're met with an unexpected companion, old dude number one. They never really use his name, uh, only calling him Gramps. Gramps saves them from the whale's feeding time, which creates a tsunami inside the whale's mouth and stomach. This all makes perfect sense, okay? Uh, follow along. They are taken back to his home, which is lit and filled with all sorts of oddities, right? Anything the whale's eaten. They have an excellent meal of fresh seafood and are in super high spirits until Nishi, Mion, and Yan attempt their own escape, failing miserably and nearly dying. The weight of their situation then truly falls upon them. The old man has been stuck here for 30 years, so what chance did they have of escaping? What could they try that he hasn't already? Depression begins to set in. This is a crucial point in the movie. The main villain, honestly, is depression, and you think that it would be the bullet that traveled all the way up Nishi's internal organs, but it's not. No, this is the part that shows the true difficulty of living every day to its fullest, because in reality, it just isn't possible. Yes, maybe getting a series of costumes and taking a bunch of TCB with your friends in the park while trying to conduct a survey about the secrets of Jewish Atlantis is possible, but not every day. Some situations overcome that drive to appreciate everything, like the physical exhaustion of a whole TCB trip in the hot sun wearing a horse mask. Not every scenario has a silver lining. Everything can't be turned into fun, like a prolapsed anus. Sometimes the weight of a situation will crush you as it does with Nishi, Yan, and Myon. They stop eating, only to lay around staring into the blackness of the whale's body, crying while listening to the radio talk about the outside world. Homesickness, a feeling they don't belong. This is depression. An adventure is a journey you come home from. It's no longer an adventure when there's no way back. This is the lowest point of the entire film. When your mental stability hangs on the balance of how you look at life, it's easy to tip over into catatonic despair. Of the four of them, only the old man is up and active, trying to cheer them up, right? Explaining how he went through the same emotion they did years ago. But to be fair, he's being a real boomer about it, so Nishi tells him to shut up. Ironically, I think the old man is actually the turning point for all of them. In a way, he is showing that this hole of misery isn't the end-all be-all, even in the stomach of a whale. Gramps' speech fuels Nishi's anger, but that's the first emotional response he's had to anything since their escaped attempt. It actually shows he's coming to terms with what's happening. He might be angry, but that's better than nothing. And in the next scene, Jan cuts her long hair, signifying a change in herself. She's decided not to fall off the edge of sadness, but instead to embrace who she is now. Cutting her hair symbolizes that choice. Or maybe she just wants to go back to Japanese middle school. I don't know. Anyway, Yan then asks Gramps to take her to the fun place he mentioned earlier. Inspired by her sister, Mion goes along with him, leaving Nishi alone. Nishi unleashes his anger on Gramps' home, eventually cooling down enough to come to his senses and goes to apologize, leading to one of the most important lines in the entire movie. I wound up here and I struggled, but I managed to survive. I can still swim, still take things in my hands, still walk, still see. Isn't that fun? Seawater's salty. This place stinks, but it gives me joy. Would you rather lie around doing nothing, or would you rather feel something? Which is more fun? It's this reminder that brings back Nishi's new motto on life, and to represent that change, their entire world becomes far more colorful and vibrant. The darkness is chased away by their inner light and the fun begins. They party, they dance, they synchronize, swim with Nessie, they do all sorts of insane, dumb, fun <laughs> because they can. They live life despite their circumstances, enjoy it, and find fulfillment. Like maybe your prolapsed anus sucks at first, but eventually you can turn it into a really cool party trick. In the end, this whale's stomach, lacking all the amenities of modern life, becomes home and happiness, and it all culminates with the most colorful crazy bang lang ever animated. Yon and Nishi reminiscing over the past and creating new improv stories to entertain one another, doing the yes and, finally connect emotionally and in a way they have never done before. They connect in a way they probably never would have without being trapped inside of that whale's stomach. Because of these crazy, insane, fantastical events that led here, they finally found a place in time without needing to worry about the future, about society or life or anything that binds people on a daily basis. In the stomach of a whale, they found love. After their trip to Technicolor Pound Town, 
Gramps gives everyone the bad news. It seems like the whale is dying. It's eating less often, and if they're going to escape, it's now or never. They practice rowing, build a motor, and fuel it with gas from the car they came in on. As the whale starts to eat, they row. The motor roars. They fly over wave after wave. The boat breaks down. The insanity begins. In slow motion, Nishi yells, run, as they begin sprinting on the broken pieces of the boat and the water on dolls on fish on the very atoms underneath them to gain one more step. Their pasts provide inspiration if they falter, helping them, literally healing injuries as they go. They pass by ships, planes, tanks, entire buildings surging into the whale's final meal. I'm sure this is some kind of message about the end days, but who really cares? In a momentous moment, they break free of the whale, flying into the sky, and in that singular point in time, suspended in the air, possibilities and opportunities flash by, their lives, what they could be, the directions they could take, the places they could go, the futures they could have. The final message behind Mind Game is that humanity is a moment of infinite possibilities. There will be ups, there will be downs, we'll lose hope and we'll find it again, lose love and find it again, but each and every step is a new possibility filled with infinite choices that could take you anywhere and everywhere. All you have to do is live life to your absolute fullest. It was the directorial debut of Masaki Yosa, and based off of the manga by the same name from Robin Nishi. While obviously full of subtle nods to philosophy and religion, what Mind Game really shows is that the greatest drug is repression. Jokes aside, the future can be unbelievable, like living in a giant whale, or as mundane as getting drunk at a yakitori shop. There's good, there's bad, but no matter what, there is an unknowable universe of possibility ahead if you're willing to reach out and grab it. You only live once, you gotta make the most of it. And while you're at it, fry your brain on Mind Game, because the story never actually ends. Hey, what's up? It's Mike. I'm back. Thanks so much for making it to the end. If you guys have a weird, obscure anime you would like us to cover, please leave it down below in the comments. We actually go over a way to watch things like this, especially in the Patreon. So if you're interested in experiencing this kind of stuff with a group, it's really fun. That's the way to do it. Speaking of which, it's time to thank our high tier patron of the week, Calamity Cookie. Thank you so much, my dude. And our lucky patron of the week, Gio Vashina. You guys are great. We have more videos coming out very soon. If you like this video, I recommend checking out another one. If you like that video, maybe give us a subscription. Anyway, that's it. That's all. Google us, Bonsai Pop. My name's Mike, and I will see you next time. Thank you.